conjuring up the imagery of a giant inferno under the earth where the souls of the sinners are tortured for all eternity is the vision we are sold as hell. No matter the sin, big or small, it is still a sin. So you better listen up, especially the ladies out there. But if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 15. And on that obscure Bible reference. Welcome to my channel. My name is Joshua T. Whaley, author of Lost Cannibal Manifesto, amongst other titles. If this is your first time here, this channel is dedicated to the author reading the words that he wrote. And not that of an AI voice reading something downloaded from Wikipedia. If that interests you, please stick around. Next, I would like to thank all my new subscribers. Our community is growing really fast. Faster than I would have ever expected. But with that, this is a bonus video. So, what do we do with the bonus videos? We read another chapter from my upcoming book titled Forbidden Genesis, The Untold Story of Man. Now, let's get into it. Chapter 37, The Origins of Hell. Okay, all joking aside, let's delve into the history and origins of hell. If we look back to the Sumerians, their version of the afterlife was the same for everybody, no matter how they lived. They believed in a dark, cavernous place called Kerr, where everyone continued living a shadowy version of the lives they had led. Here, in this dark place, somewhere in the Zagros Mountains, they only ate dust and drank whatever their still-living family members poured onto their graves. However, by the Third Dynasty of Ur, the views changed to include better burial rites because their belief evolved to include the more lavish the funeral, the better you were treated in Kerr. This means if you were given a very poor funeral or no funeral, there would be some suffering in the afterlife, as you would be poorly treated by the Galyu demons of the underworld. It's not quite hell yet. Moving on to the sands of ancient Egypt and the time of the Middle Kingdom, circa 1975 to 1640 BCE, the belief in an afterlife began to take root for the devoted followers of Osiris. It was during this time that the views of how you acted in life affected how you were treated in death. After one died, they faced a tribunal led by 42 divine judges who would pass judgment on the lives they led. If they were found to have lived a good life in accordance with the goddess Mott, they were welcomed into their heavenly abode, which was giant fields of reeds. However, if they had led a sinful life not grounded in truth and goodness, their souls were given to Amit, devourer of the dead. The goddess Amit was believed to have the head of a crocodile, the upper body of a lion, and the lower of a hippopotamus, or basically all the deadly animals of Egypt. She would then condemn the souls of those not deemed worthy of the reed fields to the lake of fire where they would suffer unending punishments before their eventual annihilation. Now we know where the origin of the Christian belief in the lake of fire comes from. The Egyptians' belief in divine pardons and forgiveness became a concern during life, such as that of the Christians. There's even the tale of Camwes, who was an actual real person, the fourth son of Ramesses II which tells the story of a rich man who died but lacked the wisdom of the poor man who also died. This story could be the basis of Jesus' parable of Lazarus. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linens and fared every day, but there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was the, that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried and began in torments of Hades, 
Yes, Jesus actually called hell Hades, or at least the author of Luke did. He lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. That brings us to Tartarus, the lowest point of the universe, or the dungeon of Hades and the prison of the Titans. Here is where we start to find the origin of the Christian version of hell, where the dead who are damned to Tartarus are punished in ways that fit their earthly crimes for all eternity. This place of torment is also where we get some of the more well-known stories of Greek mythology, such as that of Sisyphus being forced to roll a giant boulder up an endless hill, where every time he thought he had reached the top, he would lose his grip and the boulder would roll back down to the bottom. Or the tale of Tantalus, I have messed up his name, Tantalus, who stood below a fruit tree in a pool of water, never being able to reach the fruit or drink the water from the pond. Now, what some may or may not know is that Tartarus is re referenced in Scripture, including the eternal prison of the fallen angels, better known as the Watchers. For it was God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people and preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 5. Yes, this version calls Tatar's hell. However, when you go back before the King James Version or New King James Version that we are using to the original copies of the text, you will find the term used is Tartarus, not hell. Today, there are a few Bible translations, such as the Holman Christian Standard Bible, that still use the term Tartarus in place of hell in this passage. But by now, I think these two terms, along with Hades, are all one and the same. There is also another passage that reveals the fallen angel's fate, which adds to the vivid imagery we have used in the formation of our misinterpretation of hell. And the angels did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode. He has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Jude chapter 1 verse 6. In a previous video, we touched on the Son of Man will judge the nation passage and Matthew in discussing the possibility of a fallen angel. But there is also imagery at the end of this parable used in the Christian formation of hell. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into everlasting life. But even adding more to the imagery found in Matthew is the parable of the tars of the field, where the good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, and the tars are the sons of the wicked one. Where the writer quotes Jesus saying, and cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of the teeth. Matthew chapter 13 verse 42. One final passage from Na Matthew is found in chapter 23, where Jesus is accusing the Pharisees of hypocrisy. Serpents, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? Matthew chapter 23 verse 33. It would seem that the parables found in Matthew are where what we envision hell as being began to take shape with the descriptions of the pit of darkness and furnace of fire, gnashing of teeth, and everlasting punishment. But in the book of Revelation, the train goes completely off the tracks with its vivid imagery of hell. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation, for he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. 
and the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whomever received the mark of his name. Revelation chapter 14 verse 9 through 11. Next we come full circle back to Egyptian mythology. Then the beast was captured and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, but which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone, and the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. Revelation chapter 19 verse 20 through 21. Again, the lake of fire description is given. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his work. The death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Revelation chapter 20, verse 13 through 15. From the scripture, we now have a vision of hell as an endless expanse of darkness leading to a pit that surrounds a lake of fire. So where does the modern belief in circles, the river Styx, and the devil trapped in ice at the bottom of the pit come from? Well, the vision we really have of hell does not come from the Bible or even the teachings of Jesus. No. Instead, it comes from an epic poem, just like Milton's Paradise Lost. But this one is called The Divine Comedy by Dante Alighieri. Now, let's take a journey through Dante's hell. <clears throat> Written between the year 1308 and 1321, the poem consists of three parts, hell, purgatory, and paradise. For our purposes here, we will only discuss hell or the Inferno. On Good Friday in the year 1300 at the age of 35, our story's protagonist, also named Dante, is lost in a dark forest where he's gripped by fear. Off in the distance he sees a sun-drenched mountain that he makes his way to and attempts to climb. While there he witnessed three beasts, a leopard, a lion, and a she-wolf that stand in his way. Too scared to pass the monsters, he returns to the forest where he meets the spirit of the long-dead poet Virgil, who then promises to lead him on an epic journey through hell so that he may be able to enter paradise afterwards. Agreeing to undertake the journey with Virgil, they enter through the gates of hell. Their first stop is Limbo, or the First Circle, where the souls of the righteous who have not accepted Christ are only tortured by the longing for heaven, starvation, and biting insects. Sounds more like being a beachgoer stuck in Orlando with a bunch of screaming kids who want to stand on the four hour line plus to ride Space Mountain for the fifth time. But I digress. From there, they reached the banks of the River Archon, where they saw the souls awaiting passage across the waters into hell itself. Here Dante meets some of the ancient poets, such as Homer and Ovid, who are permanent residents of this dark, foreboding world, before they meet the fairy nymph, Charon, who agrees to take them across the river to hell. Across the river they enter into the second circle, where hell begins, along with the different forms of punishment regarding your sins. Extremely loud and windy, this circle hosts those who are lustful of the flesh and are caught up in the whirlwind of a great tempest. Also found in this circle is Minus, who judges how and where to punish new arrivals. Next, Dante and Virgil enter into the third circle, where those who are gluttonous are trapped in mud and mire for all eternity. The guardian of this circle is Sybaris, the three-headed dog from Greek mythology known as the Hound of Hades. 
Moving into the fourth circle, they find the hoarders and the wasters who spent all eternity punishing the same as Sisyphus rolling up giant boulders at one another. The mythological Greek god of wealth and riches, Plutos, stands guard over the unending fight between the two battling factions. Now standing in the marshy banks of the river Styx and the fifth circle where the souls of the wrathful are trapped in a vile slush of the marsh. Here Dante and Virgil await the next ferryman to take them across the river. The men then cross the river Styx and enter the capital of hell, the city of Dis. In this first realm of the violent, we find the heretics who are trapped in burning tombs. This torment is meant to represent the spiritual death of those who did not accept religious dogma from the church at the time. After spending some time in the city, and then a long, dark descending path, they enter into the seventh circle, home of the violent sinners. This circle is comprised of three smaller circles, separating their forms of violence. Violence against others, violence against themselves, and violence against God. For those who commit this sin against another, their punishment is to swim in a stream of boiling blood, while other two circles basically mirror the punishment of the fourth circle. From there, they enter into the eighth circle, which becomes quite elaborate with ten chasms, ditches, that separate the majority of the sinners. Chasm one are the panderers and seducers who are lashed by whips for all eternity. Chasm two, the flatterers who are trapped in excrement. Chasm three, the simonists, those who sold church offices for a profit, or basically most religious leaders, who are plunged upside down with the soles of their feet set ablaze lighting the way. Chasm four, the diviners and fortune tellers, whose heads are spun around backwards, unable to see their way forward. Chasm five, the grifters who are slashed by demons in a river of boiling pitch. Chasm six, the hypocrites who are forced to walk in a circle for all eternity. Chasm seven, the thieves who have their hands cut off while spending an eternity among vipers that are consumed constantly biting them. Chasm eight, the evil counselors who spend eternity trapped in flames. Chasm nine, the sowers of discord whose bodies are badly mangled as they too are forced to walk in circles for all eternity. And chasm 10, the falsifiers who are afflicted with some hellish plague, spending eternity picking the scabs off of one another. Making it through the 10 chasms, they finally arrive at the ninth and final circle of hell. Off in the distance, across a massive frozen lake, Dante sees what he believes to be towers but turns out to be giants, the Nephilim anyone? One of which takes the two men in his hand and assists them to the bottom of the well. Just like the seventh circle, the pit of hell is made up of four individual areas, also known as rounds. Here, those who led treacherous lives now suffer their eternal damnation. And the first round are those who were traitors to their families and frozen in ice up to their necks. In the next round, those who are traitors to their country are also frozen, but forced into eating one another. Politicians. And the third are those who were traitors to those who they gave quarter. They too were frozen, but instead they were frozen above the lake in blocks of ice, with eyes so cold they could not cry. Finally, in the fourth round, Dante and Virgil make it to the bottom of the pit, where they witness the traitor to their masters, who are completely covered in ice, except for one, Satan. Here, Satan is frozen from the waist down and is depicted as having a three-sided head. With the three-sided head comes three mouths, which he spends eternity chewing on the bodies of the three greatest traitors, Judas, 
Brutus, and Cassius. Climbing alongside the Prince of Darkness, our two protagonists make it to the edge of the River Lith and begin their journey back to the upper world. Now, before we close this chapter, let's take a look at one more passage from the Book of Enoch regarding a place of torment and torture. And those men carried me to the northern region, and they showed me there a very frightful place. And all kinds of torture and torment are in that place, cruel darkness and lightless gloom. And there is no light there, and a black fire blazes up perpetually, where a river of fire that comes out over the whole place. Fire here, frozen ice there, and it dries up and it freezes, and very cool places of detention and dark and merciless angels carrying instruments of atrocities, torturing without pity. And I said, whoa, whoa, how very frightful this place is. And those men said to me, this place, Enoch, has been prepared for those who do not glorify God, who practice on the earth the sins which is against nature, which is child corruption, of witchcraft, enchantments, divinations, trafficking with demons, who boast about their evil deeds, stealing, lying, insulting, coveting, resentment, fornication, and murder, and who steal the souls of men secretly, seizing the poor by the throat, taking away their possessions, enriching themselves from the possessions of others, defrauding them, who, when they are able to provide substance, bring about the death of the hungry by starvation, and when they are able to provide clothing, take away the last garment of the naked, who do not acknowledge their creator, but bow down to idols which have no souls, which can neither see nor hear vain gods, constructing images, and bowling down to vile things made by hands. For all these, this place has been prepared as an eternal reward. To Enoch 10. Along with the lake of fire from Egypt mythology that made its way into the Christian mythos, the description that Dante created in Inferno has become synonymous with what most people believe to be hell. As far as the passages from the book of Enoch, one can only speculate if Jesus Christ used any of its imagery for his teaching. Anyway, in the beginning, death was nothing more than a place that was just a shadow of life, where those who were already dearly departed would spend eternity going about their daily routines. However, that wasn't until religious leaders discovered a powerful new form of control. Hell. Now, if you disobey the ruling elite, you went to a place of sorrow and torture for anyone who sins that is ruled over by the devil himself. Over the years, hell and the afterlife have made quite an evolution from ancient times to modern day. Yet not having a reasonable basis for what really happens after we die, people have pondered the hereafter since we have become self-aware of our own mortality. Unfortunately, the only ones who truly know what happens after you die and where you go are already there, far removed from our realm of existence. And as we know, the dead guard their secrets more strongly than corrupt politicians guard their power. Now, let's finish up with my final thoughts on my chapter. My final thoughts on the origins of hell. Do I believe that after we die, if we commit some minor sins, we are transported to a lake of fire where we are set ablaze for all eternity or buried head first with our fire and gold feet sticking up to light up the darkness? No. The concept of hell as a place of unending torment and torture, I think, has more to do with power and control than an actual different realm or place deep under our feet. I also feel that Yeshua, when discussing hell, meant the place as more of a metaphor for the ruling religious leaders of the time, the Pharisees, 
and the damnation of their teachings and control of the masses. However, that does not mean I do not believe in hell, because it does exist. Yes, there is a hell, of that I am quite sure. But the question is, where is hell? I'll give you a hint. Open your eyes. Well, if you made it to the end of the video, thank you for sticking around. I hope I did a really good job reading my own words. I think I stumbled a couple of times, but who knows? They're my words. You won't know until the book comes out. Anyway, I hope this video was enlightening to you. Yes, I believe uh, more in the Gnostic version of hell than what some believe that they got from Dante's Inferno or the Book of Enoch, which, as you know, all just goes right back to Egyptian and Greek and Sumerian mythology. Anyway, if you like what I'm doing, you know how YouTube works. Like and subscribe. Please leave a comment that helps boost me in the algorithm. Or if you really want to help support me, you can head over to Amazon or Barnes & Noble. There's links down below. You'll find copies of all my books there. As always, I love you again. I'll see you soon. Bye.